Hi everyone, I'm Peter Moline. I'm going to read three poems in honor of Father's Day, specifically in honor of my father and my stepfather. My father loved poetry and spoke of it often, and he mentioned two poems in particular that he liked. One is by the American poet E.E. E. Cummings. It's not the famous Cummings poem about fathers, the one that begins, my father moved through dooms of love, through sames of am, through halves of give, singing each morning out of each night, my father moved through depths of height. Now that's a great poem, but the one my father mentioned was called Maggie and Millie and Molly and May. It goes like this. Maggie and Millie and Molly and May went down to the beach to play one day and Maggie discovered a shell that sang so sweetly she couldn't remember her troubles and Millie befriended a stranded star whose raised five languid fingers were and Molly was chased by a horrible thing which raced sideways while blowing bubbles and May came home with a smooth round stone as small as a world and as large as alone for whatever we lose like a you or a me it's always ourselves we find in the sea The second poem my father mentioned uh, was by the um, English Renaissance poet George Herbert, and it's called The Forerunners. Now, back in Herbert's day, the Forerunners were members of the Royal Traveling Party, and they would travel in front of the king and the queen as they moved about England. And the Forerunners would mark with white chalk the doors of the houses and the villages where the Royal Traveling Party would stay in the evening. So Herbert was taken by the image of those white chalk marks on the doors and he associates them with the white hairs on his head which he then links to his old age, impending mortality, decline of his powers and, and other things. The forerunners were also known as the harbingers and that word comes up in the first line of the poem as we'll see. So here it is. The harbingers are come. See, see their mark. White is their color and behold my head. But must they have my brain? Must they dispark those sparkling notions which therein were bred? Must dullness turn me to a clod? Yet have they left me, thou art still my God. Good men ye be to leave me my best room, e'en all my heart and what is lodged there. I pass not, I, what of the rest become. So thou art still my God, be out of fear, he will be pleased with that ditty, and if I please him, I write fine and witty. Farewell, sweet phrases, lovely metaphors, but will ye leave me thus? But when ye before of stews and brothels only knew the doors, then did I wash you with my tears and more, brought you to church well dressed and clad, my God must have my best, even all I had. Lovely enchanting language, sugar cane, honey of roses, whither wilt thou fly? Hath some fond lover tick thee to thy bane, and wilt thou leave the church and love a sty? Fie, that will soil thy broidered coat, and hurt thyself and him that sings the note. Let foolish lovers, if they will love dung, and canvas not with errors, clothe their shame. Let folly speak in her own native tongue. True beauty dwells on high. Ours is a flame, but borrowed thence to light us thither. Beauty and beauteous words should go together. Yet if you go, I pass not, take your way. For thou art still my God, is all that ye perhaps with more embellishment can say. Go, birds of spring, let winter have his fee. Let a bleak paleness chalk the door so all within be livelier than before. My stepfather was from the same small North Carolina town, Whiteville, as the American poet A.R. Ammons. Ammons was just a little bit older, so they didn't know each other, but they may have even been distantly related. Ammons left Whiteville as a young man, as did my stepfather, uh, and afterwards, Ammons never spoke or wrote much about his upbringing in Whiteville. He found other subjects uh, for his poetry, and he seemed to distrust uh, the confessional or biographical uh, uh, potential of poetry. 
My stepfather never speaks much of his upbringing in Whiteville either, but if you get him going, uh, he actually has very fantastic stories. But the poem I'm going to read, it's called Eternity's Task Eternity, uh, speaks to that reluctance to, uh, to talk about one's uh, past, one's life, uh, to pronounce too firmly on, on what lessons what uh, someone might have learned from history. So it's called Eternity's Task Eternity, and it's in uh, Ammon's collection, Brink Road. It's so hard to tell what's missing. You can't see by what is there. So little is there that most of the time, most everything is missing, anyhow, intended or not. But all the missing is easily missed because what is there, little as it is, fills up the whole sight, blinding away everything absent. And you can't tell what is missing because absence leaves no trace. Anyway, I don't say anything about Rome or the architecture of the Palatine. I say nothing about the Bavarian pre or post Christian, bureaucracies, wars, cannons, bloody murderers. In fact, history, which gives us the only identity we have is so terrifying a tale I'd just as soon wipe it out and keep trying to start over. If I were to mention anyone, I'd mention old Enkidu, to whom I am unnaturally attracted. Probably not Gilgamesh, he was so fretful. I almost never say a word about where I came from. I left there. Please, when you see the little I have, try to imagine what I've left out. I meant to leave it out. Thank you.